Okay, so what I will do in the next few minutes is to give you a quick overview of a chip scale spectrometer technology that we have developed over the past year. So what I'm showing you here on the left hand side is a photo of the spectrometer module that has the size of a small coin. But at the same time, it can also maintain a performance that's comparable or even superior compared to its benchtop counterpart. So let me start the introduction with a quick uh, discussion about optical spectroscopy when it's applied for chemical sensing applications. So we have a light source here that emits photons, and we pass the photons through a sample, whether it's solid phase, liquid phase, or gas phase, where the photons they interact with the molecules in the sample to generate optical scattering or absorption. Then the output optical signal is then collected by this device called the optical spectrometer to generate a spectrum, or in essence, the light intensity as a function of wavelength. Now, what's unique about this optical sensing technology <coughs> is that each type of molecule is associated with a unique spectrum. So in other words, the shape of the spectrum can be used as a fingerprint to identify the presence of different chemical species. Now, this kind of optical fingerprinting capability is what exactly underlies the very high specificity of optical spectroscopic sensing. And that's why these optical techniques are often considered as a gold standard for chemical analysis, particularly in a complex environment. However, nowadays, such analysis is usually performed using a bench chop instrument that's bulky and costly, and you can only find them in dedicated laboratory environments. Now, to overcome these limits, there has been a lot of efforts in developing this miniaturized spectrometer component. In fact, if you go to Amazon, you can spend 50 bucks to buy this kind of mini spectrometer that's made from a cardboard. Now, the trade off there for this mini spectrometer is that their performance is much inferior compared to the benchtop counterparts. And turns out, there's actually a pretty fundamental reason behind this performance degradation. So if you look at this grating spectrometer, which is the most commonly used spectrometer configuration here, you have light coming in that's split by this dispersive grating into different color or different uh, wavelength components. And what you see here is the longer the optical path length, the larger the spatial separation between the different spectral components. So this means there's so-called linear scaling trend where the size of the spectrometer scales linearly with its performance. So if you make the spectrometer smaller, you take a performance hit in this kind of conventional configuration. So that's why we decided to take a completely different approach to look at a new device architecture that we call Digital Fourier Transform, or DFT, spectrometer. So what I'm showing you here is a schematic block diagram of the spectrometer, which consists of an array of optical switches shown by these boxes here, interconnected by optical waveguides labeled by lines of different colors. Now, by toggling the switch between the up and down states, we can actually switch the light paths between the waveguides at the bottom and at the top. Now, we can do so for all the switches here. So, for each particular permutation of the switch state, it then defines a unique optical configuration of the entire device. And the total number of optical configurations that the device can offer is given by 2 to the j's power where J is the number of optical switches in the system. Now, this kind of exponential dependence also means that the device performance also scales exponentially with the number of switches we place into the system. And this unique exponential scaling is what enables the very high performance of our device despite the small compact footprint of our system. Because from basic math, we know that exponential function grows much faster than the linear function. We then proceed to realize this spectrometer module using a standard of the shelf silicon foundry service. So we realize all these components on a small silicon chip, and th these are fabricated using standard microfabrication technologies, the same as those you use to make computer chips like CPU. Now, once we fabricate the chips, we also proceed to actually package it along with readout electronics for signal processing and readout. We also integrate a standard optical fiber interface to e enable optical coupling and uh, uh, signal processing. And at the same time, we also have a temperature processing circuit all integrated into this kind of standalone plug and play module. So when you want to use a spectrometer, all you need to do is to take the fiber interface, connect it with a light source, and then you can read out the spectrum from a laptop or even a cell phone. 
Now, besides this innovation in terms of hardware architecture, we have also spent quite a lot of time developing a new machine learning algorithm that actually allows us to significantly boost the reconstruction quality of the optical spectrum. So just to give you an example here, what I'm showing you here is the uh, signal processing results using a traditional Fourier transform algorithm. So what I'm showing on top is the input spectra or the ground truth. Down here, this is spectra extracted using the conventional data processing approach. So you can see that while this traditional method allows you to recover the general shape of the spectra, it does suffer from this very poor signal to noise ratio with lots of fluctuations on the spectrum. So through a collaboration that we established with the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines, we have developed a new machine learning algorithm that allows us to not only significantly enhance the spectral reconstruction fidelity, but also at the same time, we were able to achieve a spectral resolution that's more than 100% higher compared to a so-called classical Rayleigh criteria, which is a critical classical limit that used to bound the performance of conventional spectrometers. <coughs> So just to summarize here, uh, by combining this new device architecture as well as new machine learning algorithm, we were able to demonstrate a small and yet high performance spectrometer module that can also be mass produced using standard microfabrication techniques at much reduced cost. Now I also want to mention that this spectrometer also consumes very little power. It can run on battery power, and therefore potentially it can be also integrated with a sensor network, like the SenseDot hub that uh, Michael just talked about. So there are a number of potential applications that we can explore here. So here I will just give you some examples, but I will be more than happy to discuss with you about potential applications where our technology can address your sensing needs. So with that, I want to conclude my talk, and uh, I will see you at the poster there. My student is also presenting a poster for more technical details. Thank you. Oratory part of the event. Uh, it's Maria Zuber. She's a professor of Earth Atmospheric Planetary Sciences. Uh, she's also a vice president for research, a champion for the environment for many, many years. Maria, would you mind uh, closing the oratory part of our event? Because following this, we'll have a poster session. Okay, great. So, um Great, thanks very much, and thanks, uh, thanks for coming. It must be a good symposium, because there's so many people here uh, left at the end. This is, this is great. So, um, so I thought I'd just uh, end here by, uh, by pointing out the irony um, of, uh, of this symposium, um, that we think about the Earth and we tell our students to think globally and think about the big problems and the big challenges, and, um, and the irony is that we think at the nano level in order to solve these great global uh, planetary scale challenges. So, um, so it, just, uh, it, it just goes to show that the answers that you find uh, can often be in interesting places. So, um, so I'd just, I just like to end here by thanking all the folks at, uh, at MIT Nano and, uh, and JWAPS and ESI uh, for their efforts in helping with the organization. And, uh, and of course, the participation from, uh, from all of you. So thank you very much. Maria, thank you very much. Uh, and with that, again, thank you. And there is food and entertainment in the form of the posters and some demos outside. So please, um, again, thank you for your participation. Look forward to collaborating and continuing the discussion about what we can do together. Thank you.